Why do people, individually and in organizations, so often fail to actually make the changes they say they want to make? When psychologists Robert Keegan and Lisa Leahy set out to study this phenomenon, they found some wild examples. The one that sticks with me is that when told by their heart doctor that they will literally die if they don't make changes around diet, exercise, smoking, or even just taking their medicine reliably, only one in seven high-risk heart patients actually manages to make the change. Six out of seven fail to make the changes that will save their lives. Keegan and Leahy found that something they called immunity to change was at work in these situations, where we say we want to change and have good reasons to change, but don't actually do it. In this episode, we'll explore how immunity to change works, and we'll look at a simple tool Keegan and Leahy created to help us overcome immunity to change. But before we go there, just a reminder that this show is a free resource sponsored by the Humanizing Work Company. Humanizing work exists to make work more fit for humans and humans more capable of doing great work. To that end, we do training and coaching in three areas. First, we help leaders lead empowered teams and individuals more effectively. Second, we help product people turn their ideas into good visions, experiments, and backlogs. And third, we help teams collaborate better to produce meaningful outcomes on complex work. Often this comes down to supporting people so they can make the changes they want to make in their work to produce the outcomes they want to see. Change is hard, and old and effective practices can be sticky. If you or your organization would benefit from better leadership, better product management, or better collaboration, and if you find our vision for human-centric work compelling, visit the contact page on humanizingwork.com and schedule a conversation with us. Now on to today's topic. But first, a story. I grew up feeling pretty poor. Uh, I don't know that we were actually that poor. We always had a home. We always had food. But I do remember always wearing hand-me-down clothes, which was fairly embarrassing because my only older sibling is my sister. I also remember a very specific time in third grade when lots of kids in my class were bringing a bunch of junk food for lunch. So when we lined up to go to the cafeteria one day, Mr. Dunlop, our teacher, announced that he was going to check everyone's lunch sack to make sure people had something healthy in there. When he got to mine, the only thing in my lunch sack that day was a peanut butter sandwich made from homemade bread. Mr. Dunlop pinked in and said, shopping day, Peter. Ugh. So growing up, I always felt this sense of scarcity. I remember vowing that when I was an adult, I'd work hard enough to never feel that way. Then, as I became an adult, I picked a career that made that kind of difficult. I started playing music professionally at the age of 15, but I wasn't a pop musician, so even as a young adult, I had to hustle pretty hard to pay the bills. As I progressed in my career, that served me well. I developed a wide range of interests and skills, and I worked hard across all of them. Like many strengths, there was a shadow side to that ability to work really hard at lots of things. I was often exhausted. I wasn't as available to my own kids as I should have been. And I felt like I needed to make some changes, but I had a hard time saying no to new opportunities. Each call felt like another stepping stone to success, to never feeling that childhood sense of scarcity again. Despite many discussions with my wife about slowing down, every time I had a new opportunity to fly somewhere and do some training, I said yes. Every call to play another gig, I said yes. A local theater company needs someone to do video and audio for their big production? I'm on it. I was not keeping my commitment to slow down, despite logically, rationally knowing I needed to. And the costs were starting to grow more painful as I missed kids' birthday parties or extended family events and pretty much never slept. This is a great example of a change that has some clear positive outcomes associated with it, good reasons to change, and the action to take is pretty clear, too. Like, say no to more things. So this isn't a problem of having some vague hope but not knowing what to do about it. And yet, for some reason, for Peter, the change wasn't sticking. As Keegan and Leahy looked at many examples of situations like this, they discovered that there was a common thread under the surface. Hidden competing commitments. People wanted to make a change, and they were committed to the change. They could articulate why it mattered. But it turned out they were also committed to something else that pushed in the opposite direction, something that preserved the status quo. That competing commitment, though, was hidden. It was based on deep assumptions that, over time, were sort of baked into the operating system the person approached the world with. Keegan described those competing commitments as having one foot on the gas, the change goal, and one on the brakes, 
the hidden one. And you don't get too far too fast that way. So if someone wants to overcome that hidden competing commitment, they need a way to make that commitment and the assumptions behind it visible. Then they can test the assumptions and see if they're actually true. Typically, they're not, hence the need to change. And once you falsify those assumptions, the hidden commitment loses its power and the change becomes possible. Keegan and Leahy created a simple canvas called the Immunity to Change Map that elegantly surfaces hidden competing commitments and assumptions. So let's walk through an example from our leadership coaching, and then we'll go back to Peter's story and see how an Immunity to Change Map worked out for him in that situation. Richard and I were coaching a leader who wanted to provide clear direction to his team. He was struggling to delegate effectively. His people were confused about what he wanted, and none of them were getting the results they liked. So we used an immunity to change map to make sense of that situation. The immunity to change map in Keegan and Leahy's book has four columns. We've added a fifth to capture the experiment you're going to use to test the assumptions. So column one is about the visible commitment, the thing you're saying you want to do now and why it's important. In this case, the leader was committed to giving clear direction about what he wants his people to do. Why does it matter? Well, people are more likely to do the right thing if they understand what the right thing is. They'll be more motivated in their work by being able to connect their tasks to a larger goal. And this leader will be able to delegate more effectively because he'll be confident his team understands what they need to do. Column two is what am I doing and what am I not doing? These are all the things that are going against that change goal. Column two is where we tell on ourselves. What are we doing or avoiding doing that's screwing up our change goal? In this case, the leader was giving vague directions. They weren't checking for understanding, and they were accepting work that wasn't really what they wanted to see. Column three has two parts. The top half is what's called the worry box. It's where you capture the negative outcomes you worry will happen if you really do the thing you say you're committed to doing from column one. And then the bottom half is the hidden competing commitment you infer from those worries. In this situation, the worry box had things like, if I give clear directions, I worry that people will feel micromanaged. People will think I'm controlling and autocratic. People won't like me. My staff will quit. As we explored the energy around those different worries, the hidden competing commitment this revealed was something like, I'm committed to not being perceived as a controlling and autocratic leader. Column four is the assumptions underlying the conflict between the hidden competing commitment and the visible commitment. Like, if I give clear directions, people will think I'm controlling. And there's no way to be clear without being autocratic. Stating the assumption strongly like this is helpful. Similar, by the way, to what we talked about in episode 118 on resolving conflict using the evaporating cloud tool. Finally, column five is what experiments can we try to test those assumptions? And here it was, Practice giving clear direction that points to purpose and provides well-defined enabling constraints, within which my staff can self-organize and be autonomous. This leader needed to see a bunch of examples of clear direction without micromanagement, so we coached them through that experiment. Part of this was skill building, but a big part of it was just falsifying the assumption that clarity necessarily equals controlling. Good experiments need to have some type of measurement, how we'll know they worked or not. Otherwise, we tend to just talk ourselves into believing the experiment worked. And this leader decided to measure how comfortable he felt when giving direction this way, um, whether the team complained about being micromanaged, and whether the team seemed to do the right thing based on this style of giving directions. We'll post a PDF of this immunity to change map in the show notes, along with a blank one that you can use. Peter, tell us about your immunity to change map for addressing your overcommitment situation. Okay, I'll sort of walk us through the columns here and give you a little bit of play-by-play. -play. When I was reading the book, uh, I started thinking about this problem of lack of focus and just saying yes to everything. And so in the column one, the thing I wanted to do, the change goal, was to focus, to say no to less important things so that I have more time for what matters the most. And this was important to me because I wanted to not be exhausted all the time. Uh, I didn't want my family to suffer from this tendency that I had. And I also felt like spreading myself a little thin was causing me to not have a big impact, as big an impact as I, as I could have in any of those potential areas. So I really wanted to make sure I was making a big difference without burning out and being more connected to my family. Going over to column two, which is where I get to tell on myself all the things I'm doing and not doing that are screwing up my change goal. And this was pretty easy. 
all the things I was doing? Well, I was saying yes to every gig that came in. Um, I would book every CSM, CSPO, Cal, individual court coaching, org coaching, uh, Leadership Circle 360s that I could possibly squeeze into my schedule. Um, I was writing blogs. I was creating new visuals. I was reading every book that somebody suggested. What was I not doing? Well, I wasn't saying no to anything. I wasn't blocking time out for my family. I wasn't blocking time out for things that mattered to me, like my health or meditation or prayer. And I wasn't deciding what's most important to me. By default, I was saying everything is equally important. Now, moving on to column three, the foot on the brake here, the, the worry box. What was I freaked out about? And as I thought deeply about this, I realized that my fear, if I stopped doing everything in column two that I was doing and started doing everything I was not doing, was if I turn things down, people are going to stop calling me. My income is not going to be enough for my family needs. I'm going to feel that childhood feeling of scarcity again. And there was a little bit of that that um, was like I had wasted years of my life focusing on music stuff. And if I started turning down gigs to take on really what was my career in coaching and training, if I turned down the music stuff, then that means I wasted a lot of years on music. And finally... I had always had this sort of identity of being able to do it all. And what I wrote down in my, my worry box was, I won't be seen as a superhuman. Now, this uh, revealed some the, the hidden competing commitments here, which is I'm committed to providing for my family. That's a healthy thing. Uh, I'm committed to excellence in everything I do. That's a healthy thing. Uh, I was committed to being what one LinkedIn reviewer referred to as a renaissance man. I really liked that LinkedIn review. Um, and I was committed to integrating lots of, like a broad range of different fields into a greater whole. So those were all really healthy commitments. Nothing wrong with any of those. When we get into column four, sort of, well, what are the assumptions here? Uh, the assumptions that this revealed to me is that if I don't do it all, I'm not as valuable a person. Um, there was an assumption that I need to regularly make music to be happy. I remember telling myself that story a lot. If I'm not regularly making music, I get cranky. Um, there was an assumption that if I made less money, my family would be disappointed. As I started digging into those assumptions and saying, well, how could I test those things? How could I test run an experiment to say, are those assumptions true or not? Um, I decided to kind of go all in on this and say, for the next two weeks, um, every call I get to play a trumpet gig, I'm just going to say no to. And then I was going to measure, how do I feel when I say no? And I thought, all right, it's just two weeks. I could try this out. It's not too scary. Uh, and I made a commitment to try that. The very next call that came in, I think it was the next day, in fact, um, I got a call because a person that I sort of knew uh, was sick and couldn't attend a rehearsal. And so I got a call to sub uh, in the Clayton Hamilton Jazz Orchestra, which is one of the great big bands in the LA area. Kind of a dream call, actually. Um, this is a big step up for me. I love playing in big bands. This would be a huge opportunity to play with a really great kind of caliber of musician. And I thought, really? <laughs> this is the first call I get? <laughs> after making this commitment, but I said, all right, I got to run the experiment. And I said, oh, sorry, I have a different commitment. I can't make it, which was actually true. I'd made a commitment to say no. <laughs> <laughs> and expecting to feel really disappointed that I had turned down this really awesome opportunity. And I hung up the phone and I felt this immediate sense of relief. Like, ah, I can just hang out with my family that night. I don't have to drive into LA, which is a long drive. So that was interesting. Like that was some, some good evidence that maybe my assumptions weren't true. Uh, and then a couple days later, another call came in and uh, Steve and Edie Gourmet were on tour and they were going to be coming through the area. And I got a call to do several shows with Steve and Edie Gourmet and it was going to pay really well. And I would be playing with kind of one of my trumpet heroes who was touring with that show. So I would be playing second trumpet with this guy I had always admired as a trumpet player. I thought, oh, well, I looked at my calendar. I don't have that much other thing, not too much else going on in the calendar. 
I think it's okay if I say yes to this one because I'm not that busy during that week. <laughs> and, I, and I hung up the phone and I felt terrible. Like, ah, oh, I didn't do what I said I committed to do. So I called them, uh, actually I texted a friend of mine, another great trumpet player in town and said, hey Brad, you don't happen to be available for these dates. And he said, yeah, I'm available for all of those. And I called him right back and I said, I overlooked an important commitment. I'm sorry, I can't make all those dates, but Brad is a great trumpet player. He can do them. Here's his number. You should reach out to Brad. And once again, I almost, it was interesting. I felt so good after hanging up the phone and giving a gig to Brad that I almost, I got teary eyed. I got uh, very emotional about what it felt like um, to actually turn that down because of what it meant uh, about spending more time with my family. That's fantastic. Uh... Turns out the immunity change isn't just for individuals, too. So we've talked about a couple individual examples. Teams can collectively struggle to make a change because of hidden competing commitments that they share. A common one that we see is teams with lots of work in progress who want to move from starting lots of things to actually finishing things, but they struggle to make that change stick. So let's walk through one more immunity map, in this case for a whole team wanting to make a change. So column one, the visible commitment, we're committed to finishing things. Why? Because that's what customers pay us for. Because we'll see results more often. Because we'll be more motivated. Because we'll be having a real impact. Column two, what are we doing instead? How are we screwing up that change goal? Things like we're carrying unfinished work from one sprint to the next. We're preferring to work in our specialties over helping with other tasks that are in progress. We're starting something new rather than helping another team member finish. We're taking on extra requests mid sprint and we're saying yes anytime an important stakeholder asks us to do anything. Column three, what do we worry will happen if we really focus on finishing things and what hidden commitments does that reveal? We worry that we'll get less done in the end that team members will be less motivated, maybe because they didn't get to work on their specialty, uh, that stakeholders will be upset with us because we say no. And this reveals that even as we say we're committed to finishing things, we also have a pretty strong commitment to starting more things. So column four, what assumptions might be behind this? Maybe if we don't say yes to stakeholder requests, they'll get upset and bad things will happen to us. Maybe if we don't let everyone focus on their specialties, key team members will get bored and leave. Or if we don't work on more things in parallel, we won't meet our commitments. Finally, column five, how might we test those assumptions? Well, we could try a small work in progress limit for a sprint. See what happens to our productivity and our morale. We could make interruptions visible when people ask for things and see if we could have said no to some of them. I like that one, by the way, because it's not actually say no to them. It's keep saying yes, but look at them and see, could we have said no to some of these? Mm. Nice and safe. Yeah. In the end, a team that runs those kinds of experiments is likely to discover that finishing things has pretty immediate positive outcomes and that the worries mostly don't materialize. This makes it much easier to stick to the change. We'll put the PDF of this immunity map in the show notes too. Do you have a personal or a team change you're struggling to get to stick? Try an immunity to change map and see if there's a hidden competing commitment getting in the way. You'll find, as we mentioned, a blank PDF of the canvas in the show notes for this episode. If the stakes are high, you might benefit from engaging a coach to support you in that change. Visit humanizingwork.com contact, and let's chat about how we can help. Thanks for tuning in. Mm-hmm.